Hey everybody, uh, good morning. Thank you for coming to our panel on Earn It uh, and Encryption. My name is Kurt Opsahl. I am the Deputy Executive Director and General Counsel at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, EFF is a nonprofit organization dedicated to defending your rights online, fighting for things like privacy, free expression, fair use, innovation. We work with uh, impact litigation, activism, and uh, technologies, open source, uh, freedom enhancing software. Uh, one of the things that EFF has uh, worked a long time on is protecting uh, encryptions, uh, encryption, starting out in the uh, the 1990s, uh, uh, establishing that code is is speech in the defense of the ability to uh, publish encrypted strong encryption, despite uh, export controls that were treating encryption more like a uh, dual use uh, uh, munition. Uh, and we have uh, it was called the first crypto wars, and we've continued to to do that. Uh, actually, I want to take also a, a moment to uh, start this out to uh, remember a former colleague of mine, Peter Eckersley, who uh, worked in a lot of encryption issues in particular, helped uh, encrypt the web through a program called uh, HTTPS Everywhere, which was a, a browser plugin that. Uh, uh, helped you uh, when you go to a website have it automatically switch to the encrypted mode and then went on to uh, help start let's encrypt which was a way that people could get free uh, certificates uh, and remove one of the the last strong barriers to uh, encryption at this point virtually every website uh, is encrypted so um, Peter passed last night uh, so we uh, we miss him dearly and if you go to a website and you see it's encrypted uh, think of Peter. All right. Sorry to hear that. Uh, my name is Dwayne Gatesel. Can you hear this? Okay. Uh, I'm an attorney in Austin, Texas. I handle primarily uh, intellectual property matters, copyright, trademark, licensing, all that sort of thing. Uh, I've spoken here on behalf of EFF for probably five or six years now. And we spoke about this issue last year, the Earn It Act, uh, that, you know, what it meant, what it would do, and so forth, and it didn't pass, and lo and behold, they brought it back again, resurrected it, and now it's even worse than it was before. So if anyone was here last year and remembers the discussion of how bad it was, yeah, it's on, it's on steroids and it's worse now. All right, yeah, so uh, Earn It is in a, uh, a long tradition of trying to find ways to scan encrypted communications for messaging. It is framed in, in Earnit's case uh, as a way to uh, uncover uh, CSAM, child sexual abuse materials. Um, but it is a reflection of a longstanding government frustration with people's ability to have encrypted communications end to end where they cannot get the content of the communications by intercepting it along the path but instead, we'll have to go to the the endpoint, one of the uh, you know participants in the conversation, to to obtain the materials. And uh, as I was saying in the beginning, there was the crypto wars in in the '90s, and that was the the original idea, at least, was to reduce the quality of the encryption uh, so that it would be easy enough to break. Uh, and that and that failed. There was a First Amendment right to publish strong encryption. Uh, and then for a while, things things were a bit calm, uh, and I think this was because end-to-end uh, -end encrypted communications for, for quite some time were a relative rarity in the, in the population. There was PGP that allowed you pretty good privacy, uh, that allowed you to encrypt email, but it was uh, and remains uh, somewhat cumbersome to use and was mostly being used by you know, hardcore privacy advocates and, and technologists. Uh, and uh, was not that big of a threat to the uh, ability to conduct surveillance. Then, in the uh, in the early two thousands, this this started to change uh, as uh, encryption became uh, part of messaging. So, uh, iMessage, for example, the Apple uh, messaging program encrypted iMessage to iMessage and you know, Apple to Apple communications by default. Users didn't have to do anything about it. It just was encrypted. 
there was the, the Signal pro Protocol. Uh, there was another app uh, that gave uh, encrypted end to end messages, got some popularity, but then its protocol was used in the WhatsApp uh, communications. And WhatsApp, you know, at that time had a, a billion people, now it's up to several billion people, and all the communications there are encrypted by default. Uh, likewise, uh, websites in the in the 90s, in the beginning, uh, they were encryption for a few things, and thank, you could thank encryption for allowing for e-commerce for people to use their credit cards online, but it wasn't ubiquitous, and it became more and more commonplace. And in part, some of this was, uh, you know, even more so as a reaction to uh, some of the information revealed uh, in the Snowden uh, documents about the amount of uh, interception and collection of information that really encouraged uh, uh, additional people to, you know, you know, as software developers adding it to their software, websites getting uh, certificates and uh, encrypting their communications with, with users. Um, and uh, uh, this made encryption now more of a problem for the government who wanted to intercept those, those communications. Um, and so, uh, and maybe I actually want to take a, another moment to put that into, into context with, you know, a warrant, they could, they could seize a phone, they could go to a person that has a particularized suspicion. There's lots of things that the government can do. Uh, they, can, they can also try to uh, put a uh, malware on the endpoint, and a lot. There are investigative techniques, and it's probably fair to say that the amount and uh, the ability of uh, government to investigate has never been higher. We're sort of in a golden age of, of surveillance, uh, but they still were, were frustrated at not getting the content of the communication, so it has sort of come up time and time again. So earn it, earn it comes along, and it's trying to solve this problem for them in a different way, rather than say that it would be unlawful to publish strong end-to-end -end encryption, what they said is if the service providers, the big companies like WhatsApp, didn't do scanning, then they would lose the protection of Section 230. And that's sort of like, you know, a nice uh, liability protection you got there. It'd be a shame if something happened to it. Uh, and thus, I think incorrectly, they thought they could get around some of the constitutional problems. Yeah, and just as a little backdrop, um, as lawyers, sometimes we, we forget that not everyone speaks exactly the same language. Uh, section 230 is a section of the Communications Act that basically provides that providers are kind of treated as the middlemen. They're not the content creators. And so they have certain liability under the law if they are notified that something is illegal and they refuse to take action. And so what the Earned Act is, in essence, trying to do is to take away that immunity and say, no, uh, if this is going on, if child pornography is going on, you have an obligation to check it previously and censor it, remove it, report it, that sort of thing. The, the perverse thing about this, the, really several things, the law already exists that that's illegal, right? Um, so they don't need the Earned Act in order to do so. But it is a very, very cynical attempt to get around the problems, as Kurt has mentioned, with encryption by couching it in different terms. I mean, who can be against child pornography? Obviously, that's something we can all agree on. Okay, that's bad. Get it. Um, it and it reminds me of the, the old uh, uh, Steve Martin, Michael Caine movie, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Or Michael Caine at the beginning, he's pretending to be this this prince or royalty or something. He's refusing this woman's attempts to give him money and give jewels and so forth. And she goes, please, for the children. And, he, and then he holds his hand out and accepts the pearls for the children. That's what's happening here. This bill passed unanimously from the Senate Judiciary Committee. And I'm sure it's a plea to... Do you really want to stand in the way of protecting children? No. Who in their right mind? That's a, you know, when did you stop beating your wife kind of question, right? You can't answer that properly. Everyone is in favor of preventing child pornography. The problem is how they're doing it. So it's a very, very cynical thing. And, and 
people like Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz have already given away the farm with their responses as to you know why this is necessary. It's for political purposes. It has nothing to do with protect the children, at least not to them. So the goal of doing that, that's all fine and good. But this particular bill is not for that purpose. It's because they don't want you know, companies to offer hard encryption. They want to be able to seize that information whenever they want to for, you know, whether it's political purposes or whether it's for preventing you know, child sexual abuse materials, it doesn't matter. So what they're doing is they're saying this, in essence, immunity under Section 230 of the Communications Act is going to be amended so you no longer have that immunity. And so big tech companies and everybody else, if you don't play by their rules, it's an enormous loss of you know, this kind of middleman status so that no, now you have to take an affirmative role to you know, find it, check it, censor it, remove it, report it, all that sort of thing that um, is the enormous problem. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, in the early 2000s, after the uh, attacks of September 11th, uh, the reason was given was terrorism. We need to scan these messages. We need to get into uh, uh, encrypted communications to protect against uh, terrorists. Uh, and that has shifted over the last several years uh, as a way of, of scanning for uh, for CSAM. Uh, but that is, 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 like, the goal of, of getting access to communications has been the same the but the reasoning why it is important has has shifted um, and uh, I don't know if this is this is why necessarily but it's sort of notable in that you may recall a long uh, a while back there was a uh, terrorist attack in San San Bernardino uh, and there was a uh, terrorist uh, shot up some people in a community center uh, and they had also a phone uh, that was left in the car that they wanted to to get access to, uh, and the uh, the Department of Justice was using that, that like we needed to get access to this information to protect against terrorism. Really pushing Apple to uh, to do this. The only way Apple could do it was to you know, basically do an update for phones in general, and then allow them to uh, uh, use that update to crack the software on this uh, on this one phone because as it stood. Uh, in that case, the issue was uh, the, the data on the device, and uh, uh, the major barrier at that point was uh, uh, how many times you could try the, uh, the password in order to uh, uh, get in, and it would, it would sort of lock up. Um, and you know, as, as you may know, if you're a technologist in an encryption, one way of trying to break encryption is sort of called brute force, which is you try every possible combination. And with computers, you know, you can do that relatively fast. And there are rate limiters to try and protect against that, so it would not be feasible to, to try everything. Uh, in any event, Apple refused to, to uh, basically ruin the security for millions and millions of, of their you know, customers in order to allow access to this one phone and what's interesting at the time is that the public opinion uh, was uh, there were some polls at the time and a majority was supporting Apple's position that that value of privacy was more important than them than the investigation into this uh, this terrorist activity I mean it was not uh, you know, there certainly were plenty of people who who wanted to you know uh, get after the terrorists and, and were willing to sort of sacrifice that privacy but it wasn't a majority and uh, I, I think uh, uh, this is not because anybody is in favor of terrorism, but trying to uh, also value the uh, security benefits of having strong encryption. And so uh, more recently, they, they've moved on to CSAM because that is uh, probably even more so than, than terrorism or something where politicians can't disagree. Uh, absolutely is a problem. And it is a problem. Like it's a, it's a real problem. But getting rid of the ability to have all all private conversations online isn't a useful or uh, particularly good solution for that problem. Yeah, I mean it's it's the old adage of you know every to a hammer every problem looks like a nail, right? And this is in essence going nuclear on something that you have existing laws for. And so laudable goal: prevent child pornography. Great. That's fine. But throwing out this 
really important right to privacy in order to do so, again, under very cynical guise, to me is kind of the, the worst of government. It is you know, this enormous <laughs> bludgeon on something that is actually really important. I mean, as we rely more and more on technology for every single thing, I mean, every every single smartphone, everything that we do, whether it's banking, whether it's you know registering to vote, it doesn't matter. If you get into this this phase where end-to-end -end encryption is something that companies are dissuaded from offering it, that's going to make it much, much easier for hackers to get in. It's going to make it much easier for them to discover you know, all of the banking, all of the financial information, all of the medical records, all of the things that we like to believe are important and should remain private now are suddenly open because that's one of the things that the Earnit Act does is it dissuades companies from offering this encryption. And it kind of says if you do offer this encryption, you can be held liable later on. Um, and so what are what are companies going to do? It's kind of like with data privacy, for example, when the European Union uh, had this kind of relatively strict structure for what you do with data privacy and so forth. American companies, individuals, website operators don't necessarily have to adhere to those policies if they don't have customers and business and so forth in, in Europe. But the practical matter is it's too difficult to have you know, 50 different systems. So you say, OK, if I comply with that data privacy policy, then I'm good everywhere else. And so everyone kind of just falls in line. What do you think is going to happen here? If Congress passes this and it gets signed into law, companies are going to say, it's, I, I can't do all of this different thing. I can't fight all of these different battles. So they're going to follow along with that and then Again, the end-to-end -end privacy and -end communications or encryption is going to be lessened and fall by the wayside. Uh, you know, to, to uh, emphasize more on that, uh, the the cynicism aspect of it, and it, it uh, does some of this indirectly. Uh, that is to say, like it doesn't straight up say there shall be no encryption in the bill. But uh, they, you know, people who have behind it have certainly said that that was one of one of their goals. Uh, sometimes, though, they, they they say, but what they they frame it sometimes is we want encryption. We just want to also have access to the plain text. And this is this is something that's also been going on uh, throughout the, the the crypto wars. Is there have been a realization that saying we don't want to have encryption is not. You know, uh, popular and be, people like to have that, and so there's a, sometimes the, the phrase is they're asking the the companies, the the you know the technologists, nerd harder and try and figure this out so that uh, we can get access to the plain text when when you when we want to, but otherwise you get all the benefits uh, of encryption, have the best of of both worlds, and sort of the problem is that doesn't really work. Uh, you know, computer security is already a extraordinarily challenging task, and keeping uh, messaging secure uh, is you know, has been broken. In fact, you know, going back to the San Bernardino case, eventually that became uh, a uh, you know, mooted or a non-issue. Basically, that the court didn't reach a final decision there because they did find a uh, security flaw in Apple, and they they paid. Uh, there are people who sell flaws, and they, they paid one of those companies to uh, break into the phone, and they successfully broke in by defeating the uh, the Apple security. Apple, you know, then upgrades its security, and this this sort of cat and mouse game goes on. Um, you know, uh, right, right now, uh, uh, Apple is is paying uh, up to two million dollars for a uh, you know a. Uh, exploit on their iPhones that will uh, defeat their, their highest level security and give a remote person control over the phone. And I believe uh, that uh, the uh, the you know, going rate uh, in the in the you know black markets or you know selling to uh, uh, governments and, and such is higher than that. So it's it's a pretty rare thing, but it happens. But that gives you a lot of protection because people need to care a lot if they're going to drop a couple million bucks to you know break into a phone, and so the government can only do that when it's super serious. 
Um, what they want to have with the plain text access to this is to be able to get this when it's not serious. And, and Ernan was sort of exemplifying that. They want to set, set up a system where it is being constantly scanned by uh, you know, automated means to look for uh, troubling material, CSAM in this case. But you, you know, one of the concerns is if you start doing that, even if you put aside that like this doesn't work, it's not a, it's not going to you know uh, allow for strong encryption. There's also a question: What is the you know the slippery slope? What else will they ask to be scanned for? And the people will say, "Oh no no, it's only going to be for this one thing." But if you look around the world, that's not that's not what happening elsewhere. Um, in India, they have a, a set of IT uh, uh, rules that require scanning of messages. And in addition to looking for uh, child sexual abuse materials, they uh, allow for the, the blocking of a wide variety of other things under different like political uh, rules. Uh, rules about uh, uh, like if a court says that it is uh, a seditious comment, that it could be banned uh, under this system. And then the, that if you, you know, apply that, that would be having some scanning for and looking for political speech. Which you know, uh, from from a perspective of, uh, uh, of our our democracy, it would I think seem like a really terrible thing for free expression. But uh, you know, they they're they're framing it over in India at least about getting rid of some things like fake news and such. So it, it should be protected. China does this as well. They want to scan all the all the messages. In their case, they're trying to also get a lot of political uh, speech. So the the once you start down the scanning path. Uh, well, there can be temptations to move it further. And even if you believe the the U.S. government, well, you know, bastion of democracy, we would never do this. If it's being done, if the scanning is being allowed for bad things here, when Apple and WhatsApp and, uh, you know, other, other these companies go to an, another country and the other country says, well, we want the same thing, except, you know, our list of bad things, not, not the American list. And you've already built the technology. You just have to start looking for this new set of materials that we'll give to you. And it's a lot easier to push back and say, no, like our, our technology simply doesn't work like that. It is encrypted end to end. We don't have the key. We can't do that for you. Then it is to say, well, we do that, but only for some things. Uh, so it puts a lot of pressure on. Yeah. I mean, is Apple going to say, that's OK. We don't want to do business in China. Right, well, and and uh, they haven't even despite some of the uh, hmm. your iPhone operates differently in China. Yeah, but I mean that that slippery slope is really the problem. It, we talked about this yesterday that there's a tendency again if you go back to the the Michael Caine thing of you know for the children, who isn't in favor of that? But the problem is when you dig deeper, uh, and I I don't give members of Congress a whole lot of credit for digging deep really on anything other than you know have have you contributed to my campaign and can I remain in power and keep you know, doing what is in essence one of the easiest jobs in the world in my opinion but I'll get off my soapbox on that the the slippery slope here is like we mentioned yesterday once it's gone it's gone you, you never get rights back once you give them up that becomes the new normal and you can't just say okay we're gonna reset that clock and go back you know 10 years 20 years 5 years whatever once those rights are gone, that genie's out of the bottle, and it does not come back. You, know, you give up your your digital right to privacy, and you're not getting it back. It's sitting in a you know a server farm in Provo, Utah, and it's it's there. And so, government might use it for you know, beneficial reasons or or not. But once the the end-to-end -end encryption is gone, like Kurt said. Authoritarian regimes are going to use it because they're already doing it, you know. And it's not just oh, this is for terrorism or oh, this is for child pornography. It's we don't like what you said, you know. And then you have issues of I mean, encrypted messaging is really really important for victims of domestic abuse. You know, you really don't want the guy that's doing the abuse to be able to easily get the messages and find out, oh, you're staying at this safe house over here. Cool, I think I'll go check that out. It's really critically important. Forget everything else. If it's just for domestic abuse, that alone is good enough reason to keep it. And yet, the perverse thing is that if they push forward and if this becomes law, it actually... Again, if assuming companies 
just toe the line and say, okay, fine, we won't offer this, what you're going to get is it's going to be even harder to enforce for the companies that go, you know what, let's just go offshore. We're not going to be subject to U.S. law in the event of this. So, you know, good luck if we you know, set up shop somewhere else that's not subject to American law. How do you enforce that then? Then they can do all sorts of bad things. So you are, in essence, pushing companies who wouldn't have the inclination to do that to go offshore anyway. Um, it's, it's a remarkable thing. that it, It's mind-boggling to me that there hasn't been more serious thought by members of the government of what, what are the real-world consequences? Not the, you know, oh, it's for the children thing, but what is this actually going to mean for daily life? Um, that's the thing that, to me, I, I just... I find astounding. So I, I'm, I'm hopeful this will not uh, uh, get passed. Uh, pro probably at this point it, it is not uh, going to happen this year. And um, you know, but it was two years ago that they, they did it the last time. It could come up again, so that's why you sort of got to keep uh, keep vigilant. Um, but the uh, you know, so long as the desire is there, and just you know, so again, why why is it important? Is that you know we're we're trying to uh, protect these rights. We should do it by policy, by you know, by laws that require the government to go through process to get it. But all through through all through through technology to have a technological backstop so that the information can't be gotten, or at least not easily. But if it did, if it did go forward and did get passed. Uh, I think uh, we, we would challenge it, uh, challenge for it, its constitutionality, um, and it is uh, to, uh, we, in our view at least, it's an unconstitutional condition to say that you, you must do this uh, you know, uh, backdooring of, of the encryption uh, at the price of, of, of getting protection for liability on, under 230, that they're basically trying to achieve something that they could not uh, achieve uh, in uh, uh, by directly, uh, and that uh, also that uh, you know by the mandating the scanning, that is a Fourth Amendment uh, activity. If the government is looking through your materials, that is protected by the Fourth Amendment. And if they require a private party, ordinarily, you know, if a private party, if someone like you know, if you walked in here and the Hilton staff looked through your backpack, right, that's not a Fourth Amendment search. But if the government instructed them to do so and required them by law to do so and then report the results of your backpack, I think that should be considered a, a Fourth Amendment search. Um, so I think this this bill would uh, be you know, subject to immediate challenges if it, if it did pass. And I, I believe that the right result would be that it would be struck down for trying to do through this sort of mechanism of we require a private party to do something that the government would have to do get warrants for or wouldn't, wouldn't be able to require the, the coding. Uh, just it's, it's not the way that the system should work. And if it was, that would be a terrible thing for our society because then there would be all these workarounds to our constitutional protections by just sort of dangling out things that uh, uh, service providers want or need and say you lose that unless you do what we say. It looks like we have a, a question. Have there been any large uh, organizations, technical, technological organizations, who have uh, like vowed a hard stand on uh, their services? Uh, uh, a couple years ago, for instance, uh, uh, there were, there were some uh, laws that were proposed, and like websites uh, used their platform as a mechanism to to uh, give their users uh, political. Uh, Activism, so they they made, made they, they made like Wikipedia turn black and get and and give links to this is how you call your your representative, uh, and uh, uh, so have to have any uh, technological organization said uh, we're not going to stand for this. We're going to turn off and uh, make our programs like activism agents. So uh, you're, you're referring to uh, the, the day the internet went black over SOPA PIPA. Uh, and this happened a number of years ago, 2013-ish. Uh, SOPA PIPA uh, were two, two bills, companion bills, that were, were 
uh, stopping online privacy act. I think that was SOPA, and PIPA was like prevention of intellectual. Property. I forget actually what they were, but they were uh, copyright issues. We were trying to, at, at the time, and they were rather onerous uh, bills that were going to be very restrictive on what sites could do online. It would have been kind of a disaster for the internet as as we we know it. Do this, but the copyright industry has a powerful lobby, and they they really pushed it forward, uh, and. It was it was going, and I remember at the time uh, that uh, people uh, in D.C. on the Hill, you know, the uh, legislative experts were saying, "This thing's going to pass. It's going to happen. Like the best you could do is maybe you know make it a little less bad, a lot around the edges, and, and things like that." Uh, and uh, that wasn't good enough, and so uh, a lot of people stood back, and it was amazing because so many things. We had Wikipedia went went dark. Uh, they they yeah, had links to information about it. You know, Google went dark. A lot of you know companies and nonprofit organizations, major sites, all went dark that day, and that had a tremendously powerful effect. Uh, and it made news stories uh, about it. It brought it. It made it real to uh, a lot of the users of those services and that was that killed it that killed sopa pippa so you're asking if someone's going to do that again that's a thing you can only do very rarely mm -hmm. it's really hard to get that coalition together it's really hard to have somebody say you know i'm going to turn my site over to activism uh today and not only that you can't just have one site do it right you have to it was effective because so many sites did it all at once and earn it earn it's pretty bad but the fact that it's bad and people are calling about it and uh, it doesn't have a lot of groundswell support, there are opposition to it. Uh, we've been able, we were able to kill it, you know, along with other coalition members, uh, you know, 2020. It looks to be dead for, for this year. It'll keep coming back. Uh, but it's not at the point like so Pimple where it was happening and it was going to be bad and like it was going to, to the floor to be passed and then signed into, into law. So we're probably not at that point for, for encryption. Uh, but we have had uh, uh, providers of encrypted messages who have stood up and said, you know, we're, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do this. Uh, so we, you know, we talked about San Bernardino, Apple, you know, refusing to change their software for, for the phone. Uh, but they, they compromised in China. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so I don't trust Apple to make the right decision, but uh, maybe they yeah. might. And, and, on the day that uh, something like this passes, they can uh, they can make iMessage display just go, uh, this is not working because I mean, of this. I, I think actually where you're going to see it is is more overseas. Um, in fact, right now where the the most for most movement on a uh, backdoor bill is in the European Union. The European Commission has been putting for what something uh, is called chat control sometimes, but it's also a scanning. Uh, bill that the European Commission is is doing, and you know that's a big economy as well. Um, with uh, you know China, why why does China get to have special rules? Because it's a big economy, and people want to do business there. And sometimes companies have refused to do business there, but it's a big economy. Uh, you know, just put a contrast, totally different area, but in Australia, they passed a, a bill saying that uh, news sites, uh, if you linked to a news site, you also had to pay that you, you, news site. Uh, and then uh, it was, uh, Google was like, all right, well, we'll just turn off our news service for Australia. Uh, and you could do that with Australia because Australia doesn't have nearly the economy of, you know, probably several U.S. states have a larger economy than Australia. Uh, but uh, harder to do that with like the European Union or, or, or for China. But that's the test that is coming up for some of these things. It's probably not going to be in the United States. It's first going to be somewhere else where uh, the company will make a decision. Do we want to be in this market? Probably a hard decision about that would be Brazil. Brazil uh, is super mad that they can't get access to WhatsApp. WhatsApp is you know, extremely popular. You know, everyone uses that for, for messaging there. Of course, it's encrypted, and they've played an annoying game with the WhatsApp uh, people where they get a court order saying, you know, you have to give us the stuff, and the WhatsApp says, well, we, we can't, and then they will put an executive uh, who works out of their Brazil office in, in jail overnight, and you know, India has done that as well for some uh, executives. That puts a lot of pressure on, and, you know, that's where something's going to come up, and maybe a company will have to make a decision, all right, we're going to be out of this market. 
And that doesn't mean that the software won't be available there. You can still download a messenger in those markets. That means that, that the rest of their business, the advertising, selling, you know, the other things that are part of that larger entity. Kurt, I was just checking. I, I know there's a number of organizations that have said, you know, we oppose it, like the ACLU and obviously the EFF. Are you aware of any technological companies that have said, that have taken the stand at this point to say, we oppose the Earn It Act? Uh, I, I believe that some have opposed it, but I don't have I don't have the list. Okay. And I think um, for some other like encryption backdoor things, they have, they have strongly said a number of times right. that right. they are not in favor of backdoors. So Meta, on behalf of their WhatsApp, and they've also they're adding encryption to Instagram and, and Messenger, uh, and they're they're in favor of and, and encryption. They've said that elsewhere. But uh, I am not. Uh, one of the challenges is when it's you know framed in these for the children, uh, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I don't know the status of their opposition. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, I just was curious. You mentioned at the very beginning of this that uh, this version of Earn It was Earn It on steroids. Um, but everything that we've kind of talked about seems like effects that we talked about in the other earn it conversations that you know every iteration uh have had getting rid of 230 etc i just wondered if you could if you could ex you know tell us about maybe one or two of the biggest things that are worse about this version versus the previous I, one aspect that was worth about this version of the previous was that Senator Leahy had put in an amendment to the previous version that was designed to uh, make it so that like uh, it was less pressure on encryption that like the f the fact that you were encrypted was, was solely you, you couldn't be um, forgetting the wording I can, I can look it up but uh, I'll just tell you the gist of it is that there was something which we felt was not enough like it didn't solve the problems of, of earn it but it mitigated them and that that uh, uh, was amended uh, into the bill, but not amended into, not put into the the new one. So that safety valve of, of mitigation again, not enough of a mitigation, but at least something was no longer there. To me, <clears throat> excuse me. To me, one of the worst things is the fact that they've, in attempting to kind of water this this provision down, like like Gert's saying, what they what they came up with is to say. If you offer encryption, the fact that you are offering encryption itself isn't necessarily evidence that can be used against you unless someone has some other reason for bringing suit. So all you have to do is come up with some other pretext and then that itself is a backdoor to using the fact that you offer encryption as evidence that you're not complying with the law. To me, that, that guts the purpose of the entire thing. So that's from just from a pure legal standpoint, that's definitely worse. Thank you. Thanks. So I have two questions. You said that um, in India they uh, aren't encrypting, but they're using WhatsApp and, and Signal. So how are they um, monitoring the the communication if they're if we're using WhatsApp and Signal. So uh, WhatsApp and, and, and Signal are continued to be encrypted in, in India, uh, but there is uh, there's a lawsuit uh, uh, on challenging these these IT rules. Uh, so we're gonna have to see what the the result of that lawsuit is. But the IT rules um, are saying that you need to be able to to scan this. Um, so that that's an ongoing uh, ongoing dispute. And my second question is, has anyone done analysis on whether there's more problems with pornography than there is with children getting harmed by domestic violence situations? And not just children, but people in general. Is there, like, how many people, like, if we if we go the, they keep using the pornography and harming the children argument, but how many people will be harmed if, you know, Usually when I get help, when someone calls me about cybersecurity help, it's always like someone's, you know, trying, trying to harm me. Mm -hmm. So is there any statistical data on that? It's a great question. I don't know what the statistics are, but I have to believe that it's, you know, a factor of 10 more for the domestic abuse situation than it is the child pornography. But that, it's a great question. I would love to know the statistics. I don't know them personally. 
I, I think that would be a good argument for. So I mean, I, I think so, and I think uh, uh, I don't know the statistics. I mean, the other the other you know, uh, issue I think with one of this is the. So by the way, I use the term child sexual abuse material as opposed to pornography because I think pornography frames it in the wrong way. It is evidence of a crime. It is, it is sexual abuse and and shouldn't be and. The word child pornography is in the law, that's actually, uh, so, but we're trying to move away from that a little bit. But in any event, um, the actual abuse is where the problems are, and one of the, the ways that they really want to be sort of serious about that, that issue is to do more, put more funding and resources available into investigating it. Much of that comes from, unfortunately, people who are, you know, uh, family members or f friends of family members of, of the victim uh, and uh, that you know the the scary internet is is perhaps where some of these things get traded around later but what you're trying to do is actually find the person say rescue the rescue the kid and that the the scanning uh, what they're trying to do is is not directly associated with that. So just also think of like if the resources on this were instead used to try to root out uh, the actual abusers, that could be far more effective, but also like the security of it. Uh, and allowing for people who are subject to that, I mean, that is another form of, of abuse that, that happens to be able to have communications outside uh, their, their, their family unit to get some help uh, and have to do that in a secure manner. I just looked up the statistics real quick, and by the way, I use child pornography just as a shorthand because everybody knows what it is, and whereas if you say CSAM, it's an acronym that some people may not know, but you're technically correct. So in 2020, in the total number of victims of child abuse in the United States were 618,399. Uh, state, sadly for me, with the highest number of child abuse victims, Texas. Uh, number of child fatalities due to abuse in 2020, uh, 1,700 kids were killed as a result of abuse. So if you just look at you know, 618,000 victims, I would be willing to bet that's a whole lot higher than children who are victims of the type of child sexual abuse activity that this bill is designed to stop. So say this thing should pass, whether it's next year or down the road, and it should move to the point where you have to take you know, legal challenge. Uh, how do you estimate the courts would be receptive at this point to the Fourth Amendment argument? I mean, I, I hope they would be very receptive. Right? That's the that that is the the, the point of the argument. Uh, we think it's a we think it's a good one. I mean, uh, you know, you have to. Uh, there is a, a set of laws uh, or cases that deal with the question of when a private actor's search can be charged uh, to the government for for Fourth Amendment uh, purposes. And so, you know, that, that, that's the hurdle to uh, to overcome. Uh, but I, I think that could be could be done, or at least you know that's what we'll we'll definitely try to do. Um, and you know, we will we will have to see. Um, you know, it is it is an imperfect solution to uh, you know uh, wait for a bill to pass and then challenge it uh, for its constitutionality, or at least from my, my thinking, you know, you, you can imagine some gamesmanship there. Well, maybe you know have it pass in the worst possible form because that'll be easier to uh, to challenge. But I think that that kind of gamesmanship is, is dangerous because even if you challenge it, there will be pieces that might survive of, of the challenge. You know. Uh, and occasionally that works out fine, and other times, you know, there there are, there will be troubling things that that remain. So it's best to try and fight this bill, not have it, have it go forward, but then of course challenge it when it comes out. And hopefully that would be successful. I hope so. I I think you and I probably differ on what's the likely outcome, given, for example, current court makeup. Because technically speaking, you know, it's like we were discussing yesterday, the. 6-3 conservative majority on the Supreme Court in theory <clears throat> should be all <clears throat> excuse me should be all in favor of enhancing individuals privacy in theory when you take the, the theory out and you look at the question of you know again depending on what court what circuit whatever are they activists of judges are they just deferring and saying oh well, this is something that Congress in its discretion passed and that's up to them and not us you can come up with a whole different answer as to how that that might turn out um, I, 
Yeah. Go ahead. I, I mean, I tried, as we were talking a little bit about this sort of topic yesterday, you know, I try to be an optimist and, and feel like we can we can move forward. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a cautious optimism. It's not an optimism that things will work out if we do nothing. It's an optimism that things will work out if we all work together as hard as we can, try very... Uh, seriously, through impact litigation, through fighting in the, the bills from getting passed and building better technologies that are resistant to this, all these things together that will get us to an, a better outcome. But I also would say, you know, I should also say, was about, I, uh, with the 6-3 uh, majority in the Supreme Court, um, one of the things that has, you know, this, this year has been more challenging uh, on being able to get a good read on whether something will be constitutional or not was that we had a doctrine uh, uh, called stare decisis uh, for a while. Stare decisis, it has been decided. It's one of those Latin phrases that, that uh, the lawyers like to use. And uh, for a long time, that meant that if the law was, was, was on, you know, a case was decided, it was like a very rare thing that it would be overturned or, or, or changed and the law would move very slowly. Precedent. Uh, yes. Precedent really mattered. Uh, and the, the Dobbs decision, uh, you know, throughout uh, a 50 year old uh, precedent that had, that many of them had said, you know, in, in their confirmation hearings that they weren't going to touch. Uh, and you know, that has, has its own issues, but uh, just more broadly on the concept of stare decisis, uh, whether you can have the confidence in precedent, it does make it harder as a constitutional attorney to be able to say with confidence, yeah, when this gets up to the Supreme Court, I know because of the precedents how they're going to rule on it. Yeah. I think you got a question? Yes. Uh, just broadly, are there efforts, groups underway to bring up the technology education levels of the younger Congress folks, the ones who might have touched a computer in their prime years, um, or, you know, have used any technology? The ones who think the internet doesn't run through tubes, yes. those, those kinds. Yeah. Um, or our justices, the same way. Like when we had the Oracle Google thing, it just bumblingly happened to someone who had some tech background. Is there more, is there efforts underway, or is there a way we can get involved to help educate these bumbling idiots? Hmm. So, uh, very, very good <laughs> question. Like, the, uh, other than running for office, no, there are things, there are some things. So, um, for Congress, there's something called Tech Congress, where uh, some people get like fellowships or uh, to, uh, uh, explain things to to congress there's so there's some there's also like the uh internet caucus uh which tries to like hold sessions it's not uh it, it's more often that it's educating a staffer of a, a representative uh who then explains the 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 gist of it back to their representative we also have had some more representatives that yes indeed have touched to computers like the average age in, in Congress is fairly old but nevertheless there there are some uh, who uh, uh, at this point you know grew up in an era in which computers at least uh, were, were somewhat commonplace uh, and so that will you know that will change over time though what won't change for, I think for Congress for a long time is that they'll always be behind the technology so you know they'll there are probably a lot more of them have used a computer and use e email from time to time, but there will always be a couple of decades, maybe several uh, decades, behind the latest uh, technologies. And this is this is a long problem. <coughs> and similarly, that's a problem with uh, with judges. Uh, judges is also a, a thing that you do after having a successful career in, in other things, and then you you go off to be a, a judge. And there's. Uh, they have uh, clerks, uh, and sometimes they will have clerks. And yeah, Judge Alsop from the uh, Oracle v. Google is a, a very rare uh, individual, and uh, probably you know, less than a handful of, of judges with that kind of technical knowledge uh, uh, out there. But uh, they, they are uh, more fr frequently hiring some clerks who uh, uh, may have some of that that knowledge, and certainly the clerks that they do hire, they're generally you know uh, lost uh, recent law grads uh, in their you know twenties or so who have grown up with these with these technologies, so there is a a, a greater understanding that way, um, and in terms of what you can do to help, well. 
if you are a technologist uh, yourself, then uh, uh, you can have set a meeting with your representative, and uh, you know you'll get a meeting with a staffer in, in the end, and then try to explain in a you know uh, uh, sometimes use the phrase speak tech to power as a as a goal, and try and explain the technology. And I would say that, like, even if this is a representative who you might disagree with on a wide variety of things, um, if they're making their bad policy choices with a correct understanding of the tech, they'll probably be less bad than they would be if they're making the bad policy choices and have an incorrect understanding of the technology. So there's a tremendous advantage. And then finally, the thing that I would like to see is that there used to be, many years ago, a office run by Congress whose job it was, was to understand the technologies and explain it to, to Congress. And they defunded that uh, in a number of years back. Uh, and I think they should, they should fund that again. Uh, there, there is a congressional research service uh, that exists today that, that provides uh, legal research for Congress. Uh, and they, you know, CRS reports uh, are actually amazingly well-researched things, very handy if you're trying to figure out a legal topic, get the CRS report if there is one on the topic and you're way ahead. And they revised that uh, uh, Office of, of Technology, I think it's Office of Technology Assessment, if I'm remembering right. Uh, I think that would be tremendously useful. The only other thing I would add is <clears throat> donate a small amount of money to your representative first. And that gets you on the list. You're not just someone who lives in his or her district, but you're also someone who's contributed. That will come to their attention sooner so that then when you contact their staff, I know it's terrible, but that's just the way the system operates. It's sad. Uh, but that will move you up on the list, and the attention that you get will be sooner, and they might listen a little more. It could be 20 bucks. You know, donate 20 bucks to your representative and move up the list. Um, on the previous question about impacts of the bill, there is a website called surviveearnit.com and it has some extrapolations based on BOSTA SESTA and talks about how that might impact the bill. Excellent. Thanks for letting us know. Survive earn it. Surviveearnit.com. Great. Yeah. All right, we've got maybe five minutes remaining. Uh, is there any, any further else? Uh, questions? All right. Well, uh, yeah, I think we can we can wrap it up then. Just you know, I think for uh, I'll, I'll sort of leave leave you with that you know encryption is a very important thing for for free society for protecting your fundamental rights. It's the it's the technology that is going to be the last line of defense when policy fails, when laws fails. If you have a technology that can keep secure communications, allowing people to engage in their their lives, have private conversations, political organizing, or just. Uh, uh, enjoying the ability to have a conversation without someone looking over your shoulder. So we have to protect that, make sure that it's available. So as these bills uh, come up, uh, you know, pay attention to uh, as a, you know when it comes back, maybe with a different name, maybe with a different technique. Uh, we'll be talking about it at EFF.org on our website. You'll probably see it if you follow the tech press. And then when you see something, you'll, you'll you know, reach out to your representative and get involved and right. let your opinion be known. That's what I was going to say. Write your congressman, write your congresswoman, tell him or her that you're opposed, give brief, succinct reasons why, and the more pushback, the better on this issue. Thank you all for coming. We appreciate you. Please uh, rate the panel and hopefully approve Thank it. You. Thank you.